In this lecture, we shall define the mission, the aesthetic agenda that the new critics set for themselves. We shall discover how much of their criticism was developed in reaction to a rationalistic, positivistic view of society that threatened to render poetry useless and irrelevant. We will analyze first how I.A. Richards, in Practical Criticism, crafted a distinction between emotional belief and intellectual belief that allowed him to create a separate sphere for poetry, safe from the encroachments of science. We shall then explore how John Crow Ransom, in Criticism as Pure Speculation, sought to break down Richard's simple dichotomy in favor of an ontological view of poetry that treated the poem as a concrete universal. All right, as I've said before, in these two lectures, we will explore the theories of the new critics. Now, nearly all the new critics hail from the American Deep South. Only big uh, uh, difference or exception is I.A. Richards, who actually was British. All the rest of them are American, mostly from the South. They tend to be conservative and canonical in their approach to poetry. And we might add that most of them were religious as well. Now, you can imagine that the, uh, the Yankee uh, sort of academia of New England does not like the new critics. They've got three strikes against them now. They're Southerners, they're conservative, they're canonical, and they're religious. Four strikes against them. They are not in favor today. Now, in this lecture, we will focus on I.A. Richards and John Crow Ransom, two early new critics. In the next lecture, W.K. Wimsatt and Cleanth Brooks, who are the next generation of new critics. Also, students may wish to consult the work of R.K. Blackmer, Alan Taint, Tate, Ivor Winters, William Empson, and Monroe C. Beardsley. They, too, are well worth studying as new critics, but I've chosen these four. Now, most new critics are best known for their skill at poetic explication, for close readings of poems. And we will talk about that in the next lecture. But I want to do something different in this lecture. And the reason is, is that too often new criticism is reduced only to close reading. There is a lot more to new criticism than just close reading. And so often when new critics are attacked, it is what we call a straw man that is being attacked. The difference is that rather than just close readers, and that is important, they also had a vital aesthetic agenda and mission that they were trying to do. There is a mission to new criticism, not just a pragmatism to it. Now, what is this mission? All the new critics in one way or another felt and feared the growing corrosive influence of science, an influence that threatened to render poetry irrelevant. And it's all linked to positivism. Positivism, the reigning religion of their day, early 20th century, and actually late 19th, early 20th, held that rationalism, progress, and technology would usher in a new age of happiness. This is linked to that four ages of poetry that, uh, that, that Shelley attacked, this idea that poetry is useless in a technological age. Well, again, positivism puts its hope in technology. Now, we live after the atom bomb. Positivism has died a little bit as a faith in, you know, you know, this, this whole idea of these beautiful glass buildings, a world of perfect science, that's died down a bit now after the wars. But in their time, everybody like H.G. Wells thought science was going to take us to the new millennium. Now, to aid in this social transformation, the positives believed, poetry would have to give way to science. Values would give way to facts, the private to the public, internal to the external. Do away with all of those values. We need to be serious, we need to be factual if we're going to bring in this new world of science and technology. And language too, the positive said, would have to become more concrete, less slippery, in other words. They insisted that there be a one-to-one -one correspondence between words and the objects or ideas that those words are supposed to signify. In other words, they insisted everything is denotation. One word, one meaning. None of this connotation where words are slippery and can mean lots of different things. What does that mean, of course? That means irony, metaphor, symbolism, paradox, ambiguity, the lifeblood of poetry, has got to be purged as ancient relics of the old, unenlightened days of religion 
mystery, ritual, and superstition. We've got to throw that out if we're going to march into the brave new world. And that's a threat to poetry. Any of you who have read George Orwell's great essay, Poetry, uh, I'm sorry, Politics and the English Language, he shows how positivism, he also was against positivism, how it ends up messing up language and, 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 and making a language that, that, that no, no longer has the beauty. Newspeak, if you've ever read 1984, is a language that tries to purge words of all their connotations. And what happens is, when you purge words of their connotations, people can only think in one way. If all the words have one meaning, you can only think in one way, and that can control people. That was Orwell's problem with it. But again, the new critic's problem is, it throws out all that irony that is so important to poetry. Now, although the new critics might have responded to positivism by retreating back to romantic subjectivity, just withdrawing, instead, the new critics chose another subjective way instead of doing I'm sorry an objective way rather than being subjective they decided to be objective in other words they thought, sought instead to erect an aesthetic wall around poetry that would preserve it as a complete self-enclosed artifact that obeyed its own laws poetry is under attack we need to protect poetry. We need to turn poetry into its own world that runs by its own laws. This, by the way, is very Kantian, and new critics are often thought of as neo-Kantians. The new critics chose to take a formalist approach to literature, again, like Kant, one that privileges form over content, for it discovers in the aesthetic form of a poem something that borders on the perfect and the transcendent. And if that's true, if they can do that, then over this timeless microcosm, right, microcosm, Greek for little world, over this timeless little world, the physical, historical forces of decay and change, not to mention the laws of science, could have no power. If you make poetry into its own universe of frozen, perfect, timeless truths, then nothing can attack it, nothing can tear it down. So this was their mission. This was their way of preserving poetry. And it's possible. Maybe poetry would have become sort of obsolete if it wasn't for them. I think they really did do an important work. I suppose poetry would have come back eventually, as most things do. Uh, but I think what they did was very important and very necessary at the time they did it. All right, let's talk about I.A. Richards now specifically. Remember I said he's British, but he inspired the American school of new criticism. Richards was one of the first critics to see the dangers of positivism for those devoted to the composing, analyzing, and teaching of poetry. He saw the danger of positivism early on, and he was the first critic to fight it by creating a separate space for poetry. He sort of started this, calling back on Kant, started this method, this way of defending or preserving poetry. You see, Richards, he well knew that the truths arrived at in poetry were too abstract, too private, too emotional to be taken seriously by an empirical, scientific age that had purged itself of non-factual truth claims. And he knew as well that if poetry were to compete with science on the positivistic playing field of fact and reason, it would lose hands down. Poetry cannot stand up to the scientific rules of verification and, and, and you know, logical proof and systematic thinking. He knew that if, if, if poetry fought positivism on positivism's playing field, it would lose. And so, instead, Richards decided to forge a separate status for poetry that would allow it to exist alongside rather than in opposition to science. In an early essay called Science and Poetry, he coined the phrase pseudo-statements to distinguish poetic statements from those made by science. Now, pseudo-statements literally in Greek means false statements, pseudo-statements. But by that phrase, he did not mean to suggest that poetry was false, even though it sort of sounds like that. What, you know, if he did that, he would just be accepting that either-or fact-fiction dichotomy of positivism. He would just be falling into this, it's either false or it's true, it's either scientific or it's not. I mean, so that's not what he meant by pseudo -state. He didn't mean false statement. Rather, what he's trying to say is that the claims and resolutions of poetry must not be judged by the same criteria or from the same perspective as those of science. Now, that's what he meant. Unfortunately, pseudo-statement 
was probably not the best word to come up with. What is he saying? Let me put it in, in, in terms I've used earlier in this lecture. It's as if he's saying to Plato, Plato, don't judge poetry by the standards of philosophy. That's not fair. Well, that's kind of what he's trying to get out with the word pseudo-statements. Well, it quickly became clear that pseudo-statements was too crude and too problematic and, and not clear enough. And so, in practical criticism, a later, more mature work, Richards refined his terminology replacing the cruder notion of pseudo-statements with a more nuanced distinction between intellectual belief and emotional belief. Intellectual belief will be linked to science. Emotional belief will be linked to poetry. Let's see how the dichotomy works. According to Richards, intellectual belief occurs in a rational context of logical consistency, and it seeks as its end the fusion of all ideas into a perfect, ordered system. That's what intellectual belief does. That's what science does. It wants to be rational. It wants to be logical. It has to be consistent in a sort of mathematical way. One plus one was always equal to. And again, the end point, what intellectual belief is seeking, is a perfect, ordered system. Some kind of, uh, you know, uh, theory or system that everything can work together in consistently. Emotional belief, on the other hand, occurs in an emotional context of sentiments and feelings. Not in that rational context of logical consistency, but again, an emotional context of sentiments and feelings. Its end is to so order ideas around our emotional needs and desires as to pave the way for their fulfillment. Again, you cannot treat a poem like a mathematical proof, and you can't judge it that way. Poems are linked towards emotion. What they're trying to do is to fulfill our emotional needs rather than a need for an intellectual system. And so, emotional belief is not verified by any external standard of systematic coherence, but by its success at meeting our emotional needs and desires. Again, totally different criteria going on here. Does it meet our emotional needs? Therefore, it's good. That's how you judge it, not by whether or not it's, you know, logically consistent and verifiable. All right. Now, although emotional belief can sometimes accompany intellectual belief, it can, and in much great poetry does, exist by itself. You can have, you can have a poem that has a little element of intellectual belief, but you can have one that's totally emotional belief. Here's the proof. Think about it. Dante's Divine Comedy, hailed as a great work by so many people. And, you know, you can still be moved by Dante, even if you don't agree with his, quote, religion. You see, we don't need to share Dante's medieval Catholic Christianity, nor his pre-Copernican view of the universe, to accept the emotional, psychological, and aesthetic truth of his Divine Comedy. We don't have to believe. We could be an atheist and be profoundly moved and challenged and taught by the Divine Comedy. And this is also true that a religious person can learn from a poet who's an atheist. I mean, again, it's emotional belief. That is, it's working within a system that is, that is intellectual belief, but the poem itself is emotional belief. Now, this is a lot like Coleridge's willing suspension of disbelief, isn't it? And Richards admits that it's like the willing suspension of disbelief, but Richards says, I think in a little bit of a catty fashion, that he says, well, Coleridge's notion is only true in part. In reality, Richard says, there is no need for suspension at all, since neither intellectual belief nor unbelief are a factor in the reading of poetry. We don't even have to worry about suspending anything, because that kind of intellectual belief that we want to suspend is irrelevant to poetry. All right. Richards, remember, was an early new critic. He's right at the beginning, and so, we might argue, he never really broke from the positivistic tendency to judge a thing by its usefulness to treat it as a means to an end. What I'm saying here is that he was trying so hard to break from positivism, but he wasn't fully successful. Because think about it. He is still trying to judge poetry by how useful it is, emotionally rather than intellectually, but he's still thinking in positivistic terms. Positivism tends to be utilitarian. It's got to be useful. It's got to be a means to an end. And so it was up to later new critics 
to go closer to Kant, to Kant's idea of pure beauty as a thing in itself, as something that does not focus on ends, that does not halt the free play of mind. So, again, later new critics are going to get more aesthetic in the Kantian set. They're going to move farther and farther away from this positivistic notion of usefulness towards art as a free play of ideas. And we're going to see that as we move it through new criticism. And indeed, for John Crow Ransom, who comes after Richards, this need for free play would take on many meanings. We'll look at the aesthetic, ontological meaning of this change. And at the very end of the essay, I'm going to show you that this new change, this aesthetic change, also has, believe it or not, political connotations. But we'll get there in a moment. All right, let's start by looking at the aesthetic uh, uh, ideas of John Crow Ransom. In an essay called Criticism as Pure Speculation, Ransom takes to tasks, indeed rejects, all psychological and moral approaches to literature in favor of a more objective, ontological approach. Again, even more than Richards, Ransom wants us to focus on the object and stop worrying. I mean, we shouldn't worry about intellect, but we shouldn't worry about emotions either. We shouldn't worry about moral quali qualities or anything. Don't worry about pragmatic concerns or mimetic concerns or expressive concerns. He really is trying to cut the poem off from all of these external concerns. Now, let's look at how he criticizes. First of all, he criticizes psychological critics, and he calls Richards a psychological critic because of this idea that it fills our emotional needs and all that. He called him an emotional critic, and he accuses him of making too sharp a distinction between feeling-centered poetry and cold, unemotional science. Because what Ransom noticed, and I think he's probably right, is that this dichotomy between emotional and intellectual belief, finally all it does is feed the positivistic critique of poetry as useless and all emotional and flowery. So, in other words, Richards ended up making the mistake he didn't want to make. Let me give you an analogy that's meaningful to me. Myself, as an evangelical Christian, I tend to have a pretty conservative view of the Bible as the Word of God. But I'm really bothered by ultra-conservative fundamentalist Christians who always want to talk about the Bible as if it were a scientific textbook. I think that those guys got it all wrong. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I like the fact that they're trying to defend the Bible. But what they're doing is they're trying to defend the Bible as if it were a mathematical, logical text. And it's not. Mathematically, logically, scientifically speaking, there are contradictions in the Bible. But I at least feel emotionally... Uh, theologically, aesthetically, and all those other ways, it doesn't contradict itself. But I think the fundamentalists shoot themselves in the foot like I.A. Richards does when they try to, to treat it in the wrong way and try to play by the rules of science. And, by the way, again, a lot of these new critics were religious, and I think they understood what was happening to the Bible as well as what was happening to poetry. Now, let's see what Ransom offers as an answer to this. What Ransom says is that a poem is not just an expression of emotions, emotional belief. Rather, it is something that has a paraphrasable core that is as logical and coherent as any scientific statement. In other words, it's not all emotion. There is an intellectual core to the poem. He calls it the paraphrasable core because it's something you can paraphrase in a sort of scientific statement. So he believed that poetry isn't just about emotions. It has ideas. It has a core that is logical and coherent. But what makes it a poem, what distinguishes it as a poem, is that this core is situated in what he calls a context of lively local details. A context that, scientifically speaking, is irrelevant. You see, in, in a scientific uh, proof text, all you want is the facts and the figures and that's it. You don't want to know all sorts of little uh, trivial things that have nothing to do with the science that's going on. But in a poem, you want those lively local details. They are what make it concrete. And so for him, what a poem is, ontologically speaking, in other words, what the essence of a poem is, is that it's a fusion of this logical, paraphrasable core and these lively local details that embody and concretize it. That's what poetry is. All right, that's, what he, that's his attack on psychological critics. But Ransom also criticizes moral, platonic-minded poets and critics 
who would judge a poem by its moral or philosophical or political message. He doesn't want people that go the other way, and all they care about is what he says is the paraphrasable core. I don't want somebody that always judges a poem only by what it says in a moral or, uh, you know, a scientific way. These, the, you know, what the problem is, is that these critics are accepting the poem's paraphrasable core, but then they're treating that core as if it were equivalent to the poem, as if all the details were irrelevant and all that's important is the paraphrasable core. Well, if that's all that was important, then the poet wouldn't have written a poem. He would have written prose and just said what he meant. And so what he's saying is that when we try to find the message of the poem, and that's it, it's moral, what we're doing is killing the poem. We are ripping it out of what it is. We're not respecting its ontological status or essence. Echoing Arnold's distinction between uninterested and disinterested, Ransom asserts that poetry is not unethical, but post-ethical. In other words, that's like saying it's not immoral, but amoral. In other words, poetry doesn't want worry about ethical things. It is post-ethical. Not that it doesn't care, but it's beyond that. It transcends that. It is amoral. It is disinterested. It's dealing with something more than that. It is not simply theology or philosophy. It is something above that. It is aesthetic, again, in the Kantian sense. Well, in reaction against psychological and moral criticism, Ransom offers instead an objective ontological Kantian view of poetry. Now, if you're really listening carefully, you should be thinking, wait a minute, this guy's contradicting himself. How can you be ontological and Kantian? I thought Kant was an epistemologist. Well, you're right, it is a paradox. The, the, the new critics are ontological Kantians. They believe with Kant, but rather than... And, and, okay, they accept with Kant that poetry or aestheticism is a free play. But what they do is take the free play out of the mind out of the subjective epistemological of, of, approach of Kant and put it back in the poetic object. So that's why they're Kantian ontologists. Once again, they accept the free play of mind that's central to Kant, but they locate that free play of mind not in the subjective mind, but in the poetic object. That's maybe the best way to explain how you can be an ontological Kantian. What he's saying is that a poem must be treated as a free and autonomous end in itself. It is an end in itself. And you know, a lot of you, when I was teaching Kant, a lot of you probably kept thinking, he's not talking about the mind, he's talking about the poem, isn't he? Now remember, Kant and Burke said, no, 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 I'm talking about the mind. Well, if that bothered you, you should like this, because now they are talking about the poem. The poem, the object, is an end in itself. The critic, therefore, must accept the poem as it is with both its abstract universal message and its particular concrete details intact. We must accept the poem as it is. We must accept its ontological status. He explains this by adopting a rather homely metaphor of a house. And I think it's kind of interesting, but kind of silly maybe. But Ransom defines the poem as a logical structure having a local texture. Again, a logical structure having a local texture. In other words, like a house, it has a functional frame. That's the paraphrasable core. It's got a functional frame. But that frame, to come back to the house, is augmented by decorative paint, wallpaper, etc., etc. So if the frame of the house is the paraphrasable core, the wallpaper and all the stuff we add to the home, that's the lively local details. So that's what a poem is. Ontologically speaking, it is a fusion of that. Well, what does that mean? It means that critics who focus on structure to the exclusion of texture, all they care about is the frame and they don't care about the details, well, they haven't really understood the poem, for they have ignored its ontological essence. If a poem is structure plus texture, core plus details, if you only look at the core, only look at the structure, then you're not respecting it as a poem. If you talk to me and you only respect me intellectually and forget about my emotional side, you haven't accepted me in my ontological essence. Or if you look only at my physical and ignore my spiritual, or vice versa, you're not treating me as what I am, a fusion of physical and spiritual, intellectual and emotional, and many different things that we as human beings are. 
Now, Ransom argues that Hegelian platonic critics who claim to champion poetry as a concrete universal are really only interested in universals. And there is some truth to that. Hegel keeps saying concrete universal, concrete universal. But if you read Hegel, he keeps ending up in the abstract world. He can't stay in the physical world. He says he wants to, but he never does. Well, the new critics not only say they want to, but they do. They stay with the world. They don't lose the world. Contrast, I'm sorry, Ransom compares poems to cream-filled pastries and critics to epicures who not only relish the pastry shell, but each drop, each drop of cream. So poetry is something to feast on in all its physicality. Just eat it up. I love that. The true critic, in other words, is a hedonist who dines lavishly on a feast of poetry. A tasty, if radical, view of criticism that is captured in the title of Ransom's best-known critical work, The World's Body. The true critic, again, should feast on poetry in all of its physicality. Finally, I promised you a political connotation. Let me give that to you now. This essay was written in 1941, and it's important to know this date because it suggests a serious side to it. 1941, totalitarianism is taking over the world. Now, while the world around him is being enslaved by totalitarian regimes, both from the right and the left, finally, here is Rantum, Ransom asserting boldly that a poem is a democratic state. And that's the language he uses. He says a poem is a democracy. It's a democratic state. And he's thinking politically now. Let me explain how this works. Unlike in fascist or Marxist states, totalitarianism, where citizens are assigned specific functions from which they cannot deviate, democratic states allow their citizens to define and express themselves freely. Let's think about it. If you live in a totalitarian state, you are regimented. The state tells you what you are going to be and what you're going to do, and you better fall in line. For the greater good. That's what totalitarianism does, whether it's from the right or the left. We are just cogs in a wheel, and we must function. We must march to the orders. What about a democracy? In a democracy, if it works, we are allowed to define and express our own individuality. Without destroying the state, we can define ourselves and express ourselves freely. Let's link this now with poetry. In the same way, positivistic prose insists that each word have a fixed meaning and function, a one-to-one -one correspondence. And so prose, and especially positivistic prose, is like totalitarianism, because every word has to have one meaning and nothing more. And every word has to be absolutely functional. It has to function in, 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 in coordination with, again, the paraphrasable core. It must say, and it must say it clearly. In contrast, poetry allows each of its concrete details what Ransom calls structure, to function freely and uniquely. You see, just as every individual in a democracy has his own voice, has his own individuality, in a true poem, Ransom says, each of those details, each of the texture, is able to exert its own individual pressure. It might even contradict the paraphrasable core in a strange way, or at least soften it or deflect it in different areas of, areas of meaning. Well, that is why a poem is like a democracy, because, again, there is freedom within the democracy, within the poem. So, again, I really think that there's a political aspect to this, and, and Ransom means there to be. Now, as a true critic respects the autonomy of the poem's texture, therefore, he will never try to subject that texture to a strict, regimented core of meaning. If you, as a critic think that everything has got to fall in line with the paraphrasable core, and if it, it contradicts it all, it's got to be cut and thrown away, then you're like a dictator. You are a sort of Hitler critic, if you will. A poem is an autonomy, and it's got to be treated as such. You've got to treat it with respect. So I really think that, again, there is a mission here to the new critics. I think they're doing something important. They're speaking up for freedom in the way that Kant and Hegel and all of those Germans were speaking up for freedom, a freedom of expression, a freedom of self-determinism. And they found that in the aesthetic whole that is the microcosm of the poem. All right, in our next lecture, we will continue our discussion of new criticism by looking at two radical new critics, Wimsatt and Brooks.